Hello everybody. I hope you're all doing well. Staying home, staying safe. And first of all, I'd like to wish you a very happy Easter. It's a wonderful festival of hope and rebirth. And I'm really happy today uh, that uh, <clears throat> Nyogi Books has suggested that I read from my collection, You Cannot Have All the Answers. This is the book and uh, you know we all have to stay home to stay safe and uh, re books are the best companions. A book will never let you down. Hi, hi Bijal, thanks for watching. Hello Tultul. Hi Paro, nice to see you. So you know a book is the best companion at any given time. And at this time, most of all, woo, earthquake. <laughs> I, thankfully, I can't experience it out here. <laughs> so, okay, as I said, I'm going to read from my book. You cannot have all the answers. You know, we're always searching for answers in life, but it's very hard to get the answers that we are seeking. And especially at that, this time, we are full of questions. And I'll come to that later. Now to give a little background uh, to the story that I'm going to read, it's called The Path. Now this is a story about forced migration. You remember the terrible images we saw, the photographs of all the migrant workers who were heading out on foot to their homes. Well, this is a migration of a different kind. This story, uh, is inspired by a battle. There, are, these are the, my characters. There are five of them. They are soldiers fleeing a battlefield, and this is a very decisive battle in Indian history. It's the second battle of Tarain, when uh, Prithvi Raj Chauhan was defeated by Muhammad Ghori's forces, and a lot of soldiers, it is said, were forced to flee, and they flew in all directions. And even the area that I come from, the mountains of Kumau in Uttarakhand, they say a lot of the people who settled there were soldiers who fled after the Battle of Tarai. Okay, so I'm going to start reading <clears throat> The Path. Please excuse me, my throat is a little sore. The Path. They did not seek the path. It found them. Maze-like, it led them on such a meandering journey that try as they might, it was impossible to calculate the distance they had covered. Even the roughest estimate eluded them. The passage of time remained the only certainty as they kept track of the phases of the moon. Dark, bright, dark, and bright again now. That and the fact that all the myths they had employed to keep hope alive were on the verge of extinction. We are trapped, Bahanbal said, his breath forcing itself out in jagged gasps as he collapsed onto the large rock that jutted out of the mountainside. This road is a whirlpool, sucking us in Deeper and deeper. I fear our wanderings will never cease. Yes, Amitabh, Amitabh Singh Baghel, it is 11.92. Lalchand remained silent. Bhanmal's complaints no longer affected him, not even the sobbing note at the end of the old man's tirade. He gazed down into the trough that ploughed such a deep furrow between the hills. This land fascinated him with its sweep, incli st sorry, steep inclines, strange trees and meadows greener than any he had seen. Would it turn out to be their final destination? They had tried to get off the road so many times, 
only to be driven back onto it again. Behind him, Kishan came up with a riposte. A bhavar sucks us, sucks us down, uh, Bhanmal ji. This road has led us upward. Lal Chand could imagine his red mouth twitching, the sly mocking glance he would fling at the others. The journey had leached out so many of the curtsies that had once been an integral part of their being. Thrash them out, driver, the way grain is removed, leaving just the husk. Were they that? Just the husks of what were complete human beings? A ripple of unease pinched his arms, wiping out the euphoria the landscape had brought. An even more ominous thought followed. What if there were no final destination? What if this endless journey was their punishment for abandoning their code, their dharma? And it's not a road, just our bewildered, exhausted feet carrying us anywhere they can find a foothold. Jairaj hissed through his teeth. The harsh crack of a twig snapping followed and Lalchan had to glance back despite himself and respond. Why blame the road and our feet? At least they've carried us so far, kept us alive. Alive for what? Gerard viciously flung the two parts of the twig on the ground. We should save our wood for our cooking fire, Lal Chand said, his eyes as chilly as the evening breeze in these mountains. There's plenty of wood. And what are you planning to cook? Gerard jeered. The question was answered right away through the humming sound of an arrow and as their heads swung in that direction they discovered a fat hair neatly pinned on the ground. Kishan sucked in his breath quickly. How do you manage to see them? His eyes were like wide gashes in his face with fear leaking out of them. Nathu to whom this question was addressed, simply shrugged and walked soundlessly towards the slain animal. With practiced ease, he extracted the precious arrow for future use. Lal Chand ignored Bhanma's almost demented muttering. At least these skills are keeping us alive. Soon, the rabbit had been skinned and was roasting over a fire. The herbs springing up from the earth all around them had an enticing fragrance. However, they were wary of using them to flavor their food. The salt and chili mixture they had bought at the last village did well enough. Who knew what unknown poisons lurked in these mysterious plants? The hair was not that large, but was enough for them. Enough for the spare repast they had grown, gotten accustomed to. The fullness in his belly brought such languor that Lal Chand was tempted to stretch out on the ground and let the breeze stroke his face. Kishan, a fast eater, was already rubbing his hands clean with mud when Nathu remarked, his grey-green eyes fixed on a distant point in the valley. Are those houses? He pointed a long finger to the edge of the gorge. Houses? Lal Chand shaded his eyes against the midday sun. Its rays flashed briefly on the flat stones of a roof. Soon, outlines of small stone structures began to emerge. The houses that had become familiar to them, so different from the flat roof dwellings of their native land. Shall we head there? Kishan passed his tongue over his dry, chapped lips. There might be proper food. Rotis. Maybe. It is meant to be our final destination. Bhanwal's cloudy eyes spark with hope. And maybe there'll be stones to drive us away, Jairaj snorted. Surviving you has been harder than surviving the Afghans, Kishan shot back. Let's take our chance. It was only once that we were driven away with stones. Why not, Lanchan said. I say, let us. Bhanmal's voice showed more resolve than it had for a long, long time. When will we stop wondering? When our feet tell us to. Kishan's gap-toothed grin marred the perfection of his features. 
And if they don't, I say, if we do decide to stay, we should dig in and not let anyone drive us out, Gerard glared. Not our feet, nor the villagers. When we wanted to stop at the last village, you didn't let us, Kishan's nostrils flared. Ha, huh, you wanted to stay there because of the girl. We wouldn't have lasted long. I saved you from being beaten up, Gerard snarled. Mm. That place wasn't right, Natu murmured. He will decide for us, the half-wit, Gerard hissed under his breath. Hasn't he just fed you? Kishan cried. Enough! Lalchand held up a hand. We'll see what awaits us there. I had a wonderful dream last night, Nathu began. I was in Rai Pitora's palace. Shall we move on? Jairaj interrupted roughly. I don't dream of palaces, but I would like to sleep under a proper roof tonight. These blankets are not enough protection against the dew. Be thankful you have something, Kishan frowned. We have much to be thankful for, Bhanmal said, his voice so low that a gust of wind almost blew his words away. He rose wearily. Leave me there at least, if you all cannot stay. I can't travel any further. Surely they'll take pity on an old man? Who knows, Gerard said cruelly. He rose and sent a moan whirling into the air. I still wish I had perished on the battlefield. No one responded to that. Only Kishan's mouth drew down in a sneer. They had tossed around that question among them so many times that sometimes it felt it had lost all meaning, become merely rhetorical. Why doesn't he let go, Lalchan thought, as he turned his steps downhill towards the village. But despite his irritation, he knew that it lurked somewhere within each of them, had plunged its roots as deep as an addiction that cannot be cured. The memory still made him shiver. His moment of decision. There had been no time for deliberation. What was to be done had to be done in the blinking of an eyelid. Stand and face the onslaught till you were mowed down or run and save your life. It was more like a reflex, the impulse that made him abandon his warrior's conceit and wheel his horse around to gallop away from the battlefield. The Mlecha's systematic onslaught had reached the point when even an eternal optimist like him had to abandon hope. All around him, men were toppling like felled trees. He had seen Chandan's sword flash in the dimming light as he lunged at an Afghan. He was about to call out to his friend when an arrow spiraled out of nowhere to pierce Chandan's eye. Imprisoned in the horror of the moment, Lalchand could only gaze helplessly at the beloved, robust frame sliding off the horse. And before his paralyzed arms could reach out to save his friend, the Afghan had hacked Chandan's head off with a savage blow. His cry of grief had plunged down his throat instead of out of it. Gasping, shuddering, gagging with horror, he had let his horse bear him away from the testing ground. A failure, a traitor. But that remorseless logic was bloating inside him so rapidly that the stout fortress of his conditioning collapsed like a straw hut. What was it worth, it argued, adding his corpse to the bloody pile, that stinking harvest of human debris, wiping himself out like Chandan had in a war that was already lost. At 26, he was the veteran of numerous battles, had stood proudly on this very field a year ago, chasing the same enemy. Here I'd like to add a note, the first Prithviraj Chauhan won the first Battle of the Rai. But the next year, Muhammad Ghori came back more ferociously. He had experienced his share of carnage, was participating in it as enthusiastically as his adversary till just moments ago. 
in the business of bloodletting and hacking off of limbs. But at that particular moment, all he had wanted was to get away from the shrieks of the dying and wounded, the women's desperate wails, the trumpeting of maddened elephants, the neighing of agitating, agitated horses, and the Afghans' ominous war cries, already intoxicated with the prospect of victory. How much can change in a year, or rather, in just a few hours? He had let his horse choose the path. Men were scattering in all directions, calling out to others to join them. To the town, some cried, to Tarai. Who was to follow? The deluge of arrows still rained incessantly, neighing frantically. His horse had borne him further and further away, but it was only when he had reached the ends of the killing field that he picked up the parallel sound of hoofs pounding alongside, heard someone panting fearfully next to him, the aristocratic Bhanmal. Son, son, where shall we go? Just keep going, sa. They had chanced on the other three at the first village they had stopped at, a negligible cluster of mad dwellings. How often had he ridden past such hamlets without a second glance? never dreaming that some day he would gaze at one with the yearning of a parched man in the desert. Fear had taken such deep root in their hearts that for a few moments they had hesitated, despite their overpowering need for sanctuary. Only the sight of three other horses tied to a tree gave them the courage to proceed. In the courtyard of the first house, a hulking form, still encased in armour, loomed through the greyness. Jairaj, an almost giant, thanks Gaurav. Kishan, whose flying curls made him look foppish, even in his battle array, was having his wounds dressed. An old woman was slapping turmeric paste onto the gashes on his legs and arms. It was only later that Lalcha noticed that he had lost some teeth too. A spear in my face, he had said with a wry grin. They were all battered, slashed in some part of the body or the other, despite their armour, all except Natu. The small, lithe boy, at first sight, that's what he looked like to Lalchan, had come forward to help Banwal remove his bajuband. The evening murk had camouflaged the faint lines around his eyes that became evident the next day. So, the battle went against us. The elderly man, whose white eyebrows jutted out like a thatch over his sunken eyes, stated rather than asked, as he offered them a lota of water. Bhanmal had nodded, while Lal Chan simply looked away. They had been too drained, too demoralized by the day's events to speak much. Silently, they accepted the rotis that a young woman slapped out at one end of the courtyard. The clang of the tawa, the repetitive sound of rotis being shaped, felt unreal. Thanks, Aditi. Overcome by an embarrassing hunger, they had chewed mechanically, then indicated their gratitude in hushed tones. As the darkness became more complete, the silence began to press against Lal Chan's ears fresh from the memory of war's cacophony. Stretched out on the straw coarse, uh, coarse straw mats the man had apologetically provided, huddled under the tattered covering that smelt of the cow shed, all he wanted was to sleep, to shut out the images still clamouring in his mind. But sleep had been a tease, giving itself in niggard morsels. It was not just the mid-January cold, the balls of cow dung smouldering near them provided only an impression of heat. He had started awake over and over again to escape the torment of his dreams. Beside him, Bhanmal twitched and moaned, pounded his heels on the ground. Jairaj's shout had jerked him awake once. Maro! Maro! he had yelled. Only Kishan and Nathu seemed to sleep <clears throat> without a care. 
The sky was still a powdery charcoal grey when he heard his host stirring. Someone was coaxing flames from a fire, another intoning a prayer. Farmers rose early to tend to their fields, he had heard. It soon became clear that crops were the last things on their hosts' minds. In between, offering a frugal breakfast of milk and parched gram to their guests, they were busy gathering their few belongings together. A dhoti, an angarkha, a blanket, some utensils, bundles of provisions. Fodder for the animals. He had not been able to collect his thoughts sufficiently yet to decide what he should do next. Head homeward towards Delhi? Try his luck at the town of Tarai to regroup with others like him who might have survived? He had still believed those were valid options. Are you going on a journey? Jairaj had asked the old man after a while. He had folded his hands adopted that deferential, half-bowing posture he'd maintained towards them ever since they arrived. It's time to move to a safer place, G. Now that the battle has been lost, the Afghans will spare no one in the area around the Rai. The town people may be able to buy their lives, but what have we to offer? Better to leave before they find us. Hi, hi, Namita. He had gazed at them for a few minutes, then continued, examining his hands. If a humble man like me can offer some advice, G, they will be on the lookout for runaway soldiers too. You need to put some distance between yourselves and them. Run away. The word jolted Lalchand out of his stupor and rang in his ears. Bhagora. While he was quite conscious of what he had done, in that desperate moment of decision, the shame of that epithet had retreated to some remote, inaccessible crevice of his brain. Bhagora, nausea uncurled like a slimy worm inside him. Had he lost his senses in the instant that he shelved his dharm? The knowledge hammered his head. All his earlier fears, feats of valor, sorry, all his earlier feats of valor was nothing now. Their glory lost as inexorably as Chandan's life. How could he have thought of returning home? In a flash of distasteful insight, he witnessed the same notion mirrored in the others' faces. Bhanwal, twisting the numerous wing rings on his naughty fingers over and over again, Jairaj just frowned, burrowing deeper into his forehead as his gaze dug into the courtyard floor. Kishan tugging at the ends of his moustache as if he wanted to tear it out. Only Nathu left out a soft, sibilant sigh. A desperate thought ripped through his mind. Should they return to Tarai, seek out an opportunity to retrieve what fragments of honour they could? Banmar's measured, courtly tones interrupted his flow of thought. My sons, Having retreated from the battlefield to save our lives, it would be wiser to continue on the same course. At that time, being the eldest, still imbued with the aura of authority, he had taken the decisions. They had deferred to him without dispute, even the contrary, Jairaj. Once the Afghanis have filled their bellies, they will return to their barbarous lands. We can go back then to rally around our leaders, reclaim our lands and the familiar patterns of our lives. Panmal's grave, deep voice, the dignity his clipped grey beard endowed him with, his almost poetic words reassured them. With a few sentences, he had buried the indignity of the word Bhagora. The old villager was a rustic, his vocabulary limited. They had been prudent. True valour did not mean throwing your life away, but saving it for another battle, for the welfare of your own. They would return, pick up the scattered threads of their existence, weave the old design into them again. A vision of his family reared up, his aged father pulling at his hookah, his mother ensconced 
in her prayer room, his wife, Nandakumari, her pert, dark-skinned face with its sideways smile, his two laughing, leaping boys, his two-year-old daughter forever clamoring for a perch on his shoulder. How thankful he was that he had left his family in Delhi instead of transporting them to the field like many did, even the king. He had been foresighted enough to spare them that horror. He could see Kishan's face brightening. The clouds seemed to flee from Jairaj's taut brow too. Only Nathu remained inscrutable. We should leave this place, he added simply, startling them as if he'd read some ill omen into it. It was the first time they had heard his voice. It was, it was high-pitched and had a somewhat brassy resonance that compelled you to dwell on his words. The villagers were piling their possessions into their bullock carts. Women were clambering in, pulling up children, tucking them into their laps. As they rose, he could not help registering the thought that they, who had possessed so much in their real lives, had nothing to carry but themselves and, of course, their weapons. At that instant, his gaze propelled itself to the armor they had discarded last night. He was not the only one contemplating it. I beg you, kind sir, the, the old man folded his hands again. Please remove it. If the Mlechas come and find it here, they may demolish our poor buildings completely. There, there is a blind well on the outskirts of the village. You can throw it in there. Maybe recover it later. That is a wise suggestion, my good man, Bhanma nodded. But as they flung those metal casings that had carapaced their vulnerable frames so effectively into the well, Lal Chand experienced a ripple of unease, as if that warrior part of him was being sloughed off, consigned to a bottomless pit. The uncomfortable thought returned like a niggling ache. How much of his essential self had he discarded on the battlefield? Ma Bhavani willing, we will return and reclaim it. He flung a cheery glance at the others to camouflage his despair. To his dismay, he discovered that the same gloom had settled on their faces too. Bahanmal opened his mouth to say something, then stopped. Perhaps he wanted to tell them about the many battles that had served him in, but was afraid of his own effervescing emotions. Jairaj twisted his face into the grimace they were to become familiar with, while Kishan covered his face for a brief moment. When he took his hands away, a ray of the rising sun lit the wetness on his cheeks, and Nathu grunted as if he were taking on a heavier weight than the one he was discarding. Lalchan shivered as the early morning wind speared through his angarkha. He felt totally exposed now, not only to the, the elements, but to whatever else providence was cooking up for him. The sounds emerging from the somewhat pitiful cavalcade had seemed distant in the beginning. Cows lowing, an infant crying for its mother's breast, an old man coughing. Only when a woman's prolonged wailing was shaped into words did his head begin to throb. It was a diatribe against fate, against looting invaders, against kings who could not protect their people, soldiers who could not hold up in the battlefield, an elegy for the familiar life she had been compelled to abandon. Why? She kept asking. Why? Over and over again. Jogging along listlessly, Lalcha then wondered if he would ever find the answer. Now, with his hopeful feet bearing him towards yet another unknown destination, he realized he was no closer to it. And this is the end of the story. Well, why is the question we are always asking, and even at this point of time, so many of us are asking this question. Why is this happening? Why? What is the reason behind it? What, have, what did we do to deserve this? 
but there are some questions for which you just cannot find the answers and somehow you have to keep going despite the fact that you cannot rationalize what is happening like the terrible epidemic that has taken hold of the world. So thanks a lot for listening and uh, I wish you find much solace in books and reading and please stay home, stay safe. And this is the book I'm, I was reading from, You Cannot Have All the Answers, published by Nyogi Books. And a Kindle version is also available. So thanks a lot, dear friends. And I wish you all the best again and wish that we can return to our familiar lives. God bless everyone. Goodbye. Bye. Garima.